So we'll start off with some terminology. So the word metaphysics was introduced by Aristotle's students to, as, a, as a shorthand term for the lectures which came after the physics. So metaphysics just means after the physics. Gradually, however, it came to mean uh, what some people call the study of being qua being, or the study of what there is. And uh, in around 1652, a German philosopher by the name of Lohart, or Lohardo, who, like, I guess, all other German philosophers at that time, wrote in Latin, coined a new technical term, uh, which literally translated means the theory of being, or the theory of what is, or the theory of entities, which he coined as the term ontologia. And that term then um, caught on in the English-speaking world. Um, I like to think of on ontology and metaphysics as being synonyms. So they're just two words for the same thing. Now, some people will, will make a distinction I, I, used in the philosophical sense. The two words, I think, mean the same thing. Now, if you look in the history, you'll see that metaphysics has often included branches which ontology does not include. Uh, that's one kind of differential use between the two terms. For instance, metaphysics might include a branch which deals with the being of God, and so it would overlap with theology, where ontology might not include a branch like that. And there were various other ways in which the, there were precise terminological uses for metaphysics and ontology, which made them out to be non-synonyms. I don't care about differences like that. So I'm just going to treat metaphysics and ontology in the philosophical sense of ontology as synonyms. So this could equally well be called a course in analytic ontology if it wasn't for the fact that there is another sense of ontology which is nowadays probably overwhelmingly more common than the old-fashioned philosophical sense which deals with ontologies built to support computational reasoning <coughs> of various sorts. Now, this is a course on analytic ontology in the philosophical sense. So it's a philosophical course. It may be the last philosophical course I ever teach. Um, maybe not. Um, certainly it will be uh, the last philosophical course I teach for a bit. Since next year, I'll be teaching a course on biomedical ontology, um, which will be about biomedical ontology in the non-philosophical, or only somewhat philosophical sense of ontology. But this is a course on ontology in the philosophical sense, and that means that um, uh, you're going to need to take a course in applied ontology at some stage, because that's more interesting and useful and will get you a nice job, and so forth. Uh, but this is a philosophy course. <laughs> um, now, the next thing we have to deal with is what is meant by analytic philosophy. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in due course. I, I tend to think that analytic philosophy is a synonym for good philosophy. Um, but that's just because I don't like French philosophy. Um, I, German philosophy is a more difficult story, but I don't like French philosophy. Um, but broadly speaking, analytic philosophy means philosophy where logical rigor is important. And we will do some work on the fringes of log logic in the course of this course, uh, where science is important. So we're, trying, we're going to try and do metaphysics or ontology in such a way that what we do will be consistent with what scientists say. Now, I'm not a scientific reductionist, so I do, do not believe that something is true, only if it is part of some true scientific theory. Um, so many of the topics that we'll be discussing, for instance, the topic of money, uh, will be in areas where it's clear that there are truths, to me at least, some people think that money doesn't exist. Uh, John Searle thinks that money is just a, a 
widespread fantasy. They are all, they are all, such people are all wrong. Money exists. There are truths about money, but they're not scientific truths. So metaphysics or ontology, as I conceive it, will have to deal with the truths of science and then these other sorts of truths and try and understand how they can be consistent with each other. And that will be a topic which we will address already in today's lecture. Uh, so analytic philosophy is philosophy which uses logic and which strives to be consistent with science, the discoveries of science. I think that's probably a sufficient, um, uh, a sufficient account for the, these purposes. There is a school of thought which is led most conspicuously by Michael Dummett, who wrote a book on the origins of analytic philosophy which tried to show that Analytic philosophy had its origins in the Central European world around the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. And according to Michael Dummett, the idea behind analytic philosophy is that all philosophical problems are problems in the philo to the extent that they are genuine problems, are solvable by means of the philosophy of language. Now, I think language is very important, but I do not believe that Language is the uh, sole way of solving philosophical problems. In fact, I probably believe that it's not a way of solving any philosophical problem. Although I have a great respect for Michael Dummett and for John Stowe um, and for Frege, uh, I do not believe that the philosophy of language is, is in any sense the core of philosophy. Now, applied ontology I've talked about. Basic formal ontology... Uh, is, is important for this class because in the course of um, 40 years or so since I started thinking about ontology and reading primarily philosophical works on ontology, I have in, attempted to encapsulate what I think is a kind of crystallization of the most useful uh, results of analytic ontology and analytic metaphysics in, in a form which can be then used by various different kinds of people. And that encapsulation is called basic formal ontology. And so if you want to have a clue as to what we're going to be um, talking about, then to know something about basic formal ontology will be useful. I will not present basic formal ontology directly in the class. I will mention it occasionally. I have several videos which you can use if you're interested in finding out more. And there is also a book which uh, you can read if you still read books or if you ever read books. <laughs> Apparently in the, uh, the world of university admissions, there is a technical term which is called a book virgin. And the book virgin is a college student who arrived and never read a book. <laughs> now that can mean they just read books on Kindle or something, but in some cases it means that they never read a book at all. All right. Um, so, um, ontology of metaphysics started really with Aristotle. So there were little bits of, of uh, metaphysics before Aristotle, but they're not important. Um, <laughs> and the, the reason why Aristotle is important is that he really took a scientific rather than a storytelling or poetic um, approach to doing metaphysics. And so he developed a theory of categories. And the idea of a theory of categories or a theory of universals extending across all domains, which is what I take the term category to mean, so very general universal. This idea is, I think, one of the half dozen or so ideas which are at the core of metaphysics. In fact, I think Aristotle got all of those half dozen ideas right. And I'll tell you what they are in a minute. Um, now, he thought that you could have a theory of uh, categories because categories are intelligible. I'm not sure whether he got that part right. Um, so that, the, 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 broadly speaking, there are two approaches to doing metaphysics. One is a prioristic 
In other words, you think that reality or what exists or being or the categories are intelligible. And uh, the, the other is empirical, which says that the way we understand what exists is by doing science. And science is, rests on hypotheses uh, and testing of those hypotheses and the results of such testing may be, uh, as they are often in many empirical sciences, just random. The, the, the fact that the acceleration due to gravity is such and such is not something that we can know a priori. We have to do some empirical measurement. Now, I think that we can, we can have, or we must have, when we do metaphysics, both a priori component. That's, I think I and empirical components, which are not a priori. Um, Aristotle thought that it was all intelligible at the level of these most general categories. And I think he may be right about that too. That at the level of the most general categories, um, they are all intelligible. Um, now, I think this might be a, a good point to pause to see if there are any interventions. Yeah. I'm not sure I understand uh, your distinction between the categories being intelligible and then being empirical. In what sense Aristotle thought they were not empirical and rather a priori? I just so, think I'm not following your question. <laughs> I, yeah, you're right. I did not make a clear distinction there. So, if you believe that. Um, Thinking, for instance, or thinking process, is a high-level universal, then you might say that it must be intelligible because, uh, for a priori reasons, because we, the, the people who are in the business of understanding categories are themselves understanding those categories through thinking processes. So you couldn't, you couldn't have an idea of what a thinking process is without engaging in thinking processes, and therefore the idea of thinking processes must be somehow prior to any kind of explanation, because there could be nothing simpler or more profound or more basic than thinking process, in terms of which you could explain what a thinking process is to someone who didn't understand what a thinking process is. I think Descartes had an idea. A little, to me, a little more Cartesian than it does. Mm -hmm. I'm having trouble seeing why his own. Just I have a theory of theory of categories. You mean mind, but I don't well, why it. do I claim that Aristotle thought that the categories were intelligible? Yeah, that's what my question is. Um, because he thought that we could come to know them without doing acts of measurement in, in something like that. So we we need to do acts of observation. We need to do acts of thinking but we don't need to do active measurement. So I think that the, uh, the big break here came around the time of Galileo. So Galileo, it, and this is something that we may discuss later, Galileo broke with what was the um, uh, certainly the dominant uh, view before him, according to which everything that we know is intelligible. And if it's not intelligible, we don't know it. Now, the movements of the heavens are intelligible, um, according to some uh, early thinkers. Uh, but that you are now sitting with a red pullover on is not intelligible. It's just a random fact. And so we can't really know that you are now sitting with a, a red t-shirt. I'm not sure about the example, but I think I understand. Well, yeah. I don't want I, I to use the word beginning right, so with something me. Something like that. Uh, so, for Aristotle, it might involve like some sort of crude observation that's not going to involve serious empirical work. Aristotle was uh, a big believer in, in empirical work, but not in the post-Galilean right. sense of exactly. empirical work. Yeah. And I think the post, and this is actually um, quite an important feature of Aristotle's philosophy of science. Aristotle's philosophy of science was based on not on the principle that you can uh, 
you can falsify a hypothesis by doing experiments. Rather, it was based on the principle that you should observe the world and describe it. And if you observe something which is unexpected, un inexplicable, then instead of trying to revise your hypothesis and do more testing so that you get a better uh, proposition that you can then test using more observations, which is a very modern approach, Aristotle followed the shrug your shoulders principle. So you look under lots of rocks and you see crabs, and then you look under a rock and you see, I don't know, something that you've never seen before that you really don't understand. So you just shrug your shoulders. That seems to have been his philosophy of science. And uh, the, the one nice thing that Feyerabend wrote, which is in defense, called In Defense of Aristotle, it gives you a detailed account of the shrug your shoulders principle. All right, so I, this may be important later on when we deal with, uh, with Descartes, but one reason for the intelligible, for the universals extending across all domains being intelligible is that they are all based upon a central role of organism. So the main category is substance. And Aristotle's principal understanding of what a substance is comes from his understanding of what organisms are. And, um, and that's why he thought that universals were intelligible, because the universals that ex at this high level that we'll be talking about in a minute are all connected quite centrally with organisms, including people, including Aristotle himself. And some later philosophers took that to mean that the prime <coughs> science of all sciences is psychology, because we have intelligible categories on, on, on the basis of which psychology as a science proceeds, so it's not an empirical discipline. Brentano held a view. All right, now, then came the medievals who tried to keep Aristotelianism alive. <laughs> um, they, uh, they, they developed uh, technical terminology, and um, uh, uh, everything was good, roughly speaking. And then... Uh, the French, um, a Frenchman, which I don't hold against him much, <laughs> um, came along and uh, he initiated a subversion of metaphysics by saying that not metaphysics is first philosophy, but rather that epistemology is first philosophy. And that means that instead of the principle of observation plus shrugging your shoulders, we have the principle of methodical doubt. So, subversion of metaphysics. Um, and, um, and so on. And then it got really bad with Kant, um, who said that even if we use the principle of methodical doubt, we'll never, still never know anything about what really exists. Uh, all we can know about is the world of appearances. And, uh, and so the world of appearances, so the world of him and me and his brown t-shirt and pullover, whatever it is. And these walls are all just part of the world of appearances. They're not reality in itself, rather they are reality uh, for us, which is a quasi-fictional reality. So money um, is unreal, but so also are tables and chairs and molecules and other things. The only thing which is real is being in itself, which we can't know. Unless we do ethics and then suddenly we know things. <laughs> this is not a course in ethics. And then things began to get good again because Brentano rediscovered Aristotle, insisted that the methods of philosophy and science are one and the same, and that psychology is the primary science because psychology is can be carried out in an a prioristic way. Um, and Husserl then, particularly the very early Husserl, followed Brentano. And so I think there are two important uh, contributions of Husserl. First of all, he invented the idea of doing ontology in a logical way. So 
in his logical investigations in, in the year 1900, thereabouts, he has axioms and theorems of ontology. Uh, and he did this against a, an Aristotelian background, according to which there were universals and instances of those universal particulars. He used that as to, get, to provide an understanding of language, of logic, of reasoning, of um, meaning, of expression, uh, many important things. I, uh, really a brilliant contribution. Um, and then the second contribution was later on in his book, The Crisis of European Sciences, where he pointed out this special role of Galileo, which I referred to early on. The special role of Galileo turned on the fact that Galileo showed that our commonsensical views of how things are may be shown by experiment to be false. Now, it's a commonsensical view that if you drop um, a piece of tissue and an iPhone, do we care how much? Then the piece of tissue will fall more slowly. Um, which, of course, is true. It does fall more slowly. Uh, but Galileo showed that the, there is a sense in which all bodies fall at the same speed. It, it's just that that only holds true in a vacuum. And we just didn't, uh, our commonsensical view doesn't take account of the vacuum. Aristotle didn't take account of what would be the case in the vacuum, and didn't see that understanding what would be the case in the vacuum was the key to understanding physics, or anyway, kinematics. Um, and so Galileo instituted a change, and the change came. The, the change brought about a a, a, a breakage, a, a, a disconnection between the results of empirical science and the a priori or commonsensical beliefs that people customarily have. And this change, of course, got worse and worse with the development of relativity theory and then quantum mechanics. And so now many quite intelligent philosophers of science would say that everything that we believe commonsensically is false. Because we know enough about physics now to know that there are no such things as tables and chairs and pullovers and walls and doors and, and so forth. Um, now, I, 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 I'm trying to develop a view according to which both common sense and scientific theory can be simultaneously true. In other words, a view according to which there is no logical contradiction between scientific theory and common sensical theory. Um, and we will uh, we'll talk about some of that today. Um, and perhaps also in, in later uh, lectures. Now, if we're going to understand analytic philosophy, then we need to understand uh, another um, development. So Husserl and Brentano were both working within Central Europe, both within Austria, at least for part of Husserl's life and for most of Brentano's life. And there were other things going on in Austria. First of all, Wittgenstein was, was uh, growing up um, and writing works like the Tractatus. And um, Wittgenstein was, was reflecting discoveries in logic by Frege and Russell, which presented a way of using logic to provide a new understanding of at least mathematics. So, uh, Logic provided a way to formalize mathematics in such a way that you could prove mathematical theorems on the basis of what seemed to be simple, self-evident axioms, which is, is the, the old Euclidean idea, but now um, in much more, with much more formal rigor than was possible before Frege came along. Now, 
Frege put forward his foundation of mathematics, and Russell showed, by means of a very, very simple example, that Frege's theory was inconsistent. And so Russell rebuilt it with Whitehead to create a foundation of mathematics which was consistent but really very complicated. And so the original um, idea that Frege had that we could build up the foundations of mathematics from logically self-evident axioms was, uh, it became much less attractive as a result of the discovery of the, uh, of the uh, Russell paradox. But the logic of Russell and Frege was still there, and it was still a very attractive machine. And Russell turned this very attractive machine, uh, sorry, Wittgenstein in the Tractatus, turned this very attractive machine into the, a basis for a new kind of metaphysics, which he called logical atomism, or which, actually, I think Russell coined the phrase logical atomism. Both of them defended, at certain points in their careers, uh, metaphysical views which could be called lo logical atomistic views. And this was a new way of doing philosophy now, a way of doing philosophy in which not metaphysics and not epistemology are first philosophy, but rather logic is first philosophy. Logic, as it has been, had been discovered by Frege and uh, developed further then by people like Russell. And then the Vienna Circle, which took the Tractatus as almost a biblical text, developed this idea of philosophy in defense of, at least many of them, an anti-metaphysical view of philosophy. So, in um, my lights, Russell and Wittgenstein were still metaphysicians. They were still doing metaphysics. They were still trying to understand the nature of being. They were using logic to do that and developing a new kind of theory of the nature of being, namely a logical theory. Being reflects logic. I'm going to talk more about that later on today. What the Vienna Circle, and sp particularly people like Neurath did, was to argue that the new logic makes uh, the old ideas of metaphysics uh, no longer uh, salient. So we can just junk metaphysics. Uh, we can just do the logic of science, the logic of scientific theories. We can produce a unified science by formalizing all scientific theories using the Frege-Russell logic, and then that would be it. The formalizing, the unified science would be, would replace the need for the old-fashioned metaphysics. And in the case of Carnap, then, there was an attempt to reconstruct philosophy, or some parts of philosophy, on this basis, but with, again, with a logical atomist approach, where the atoms are either sensation uh, or physical micro-events. So in, in Carnap's uh, logical structure of the world, the atoms on which this construction is based are atoms of sensation. Now, so the, the important point here is the centrality of logic to philosophy. And um, the, the, I think that the, the process failed. So they did not manage to create unified science by formalizing scientific theories using logic. It failed. It, and I think I, I can prove that it had to fail. Um, and if anyone is interested in seeing my proof, then I'll give you a reference to a paper I published showing why it had to fail. Uh, it had to fail, um, and it's very interesting that it had to fail. So if we have logic, and if we know how to axiomatize propositions using logic, then why can't we axiomatize the propositions of scientific theory and then glue all these axioms together and create a unified science. Surely, you might think, the axioms have to be consistent with each other. Now, we do have problems. There are inconsistencies between basic parts of modern physics, which need to be resolved, and which still haven't been resolved. Leaving those well-identified 
inconsistencies aside, it still seems to be a coherent goal to try to formalize all of science using first order logic and um, and then putting all the axioms that that by result together, and then you have a unified science. Now that so that dream. Um, has, has been abandoned. An alternative, much weaker dream still survives, but outside philosophy. I think I'm one of the very few former philosophers who embrace this weaker dream. And the weaker dream says basically that you build ontologies for the whole of science. And then, because the ontologies are built using a consistent framework, namely BFO, when you put the ontologies together, you would get something like a unified representation of reality. Um, but that dream is much weaker than the Vienna Circle dream. All right, then the later Wittgenstein came along, um, and he took the same idea that metaphysics is somehow a bad thing, a, a, a sign of something that we should have abandoned, which was Neurath's view. But now... He sees, met he sees metaphysics as a result of misusing language. So he defends the Dummett view. Of, uh, so he defends analytic philosophy in the Dummett sense. The way to solve problems in philosophy is mm, not to do philosophy, because that would just mean you were playing along with this silly game, but rather to, to reveal to people that they are misusing language. And... Um, and then after that came the ordinary language philosophy of the mid-20th century, um, again, following the Dummett kind of view. Um, so this is uh, more, more scientific, more, more positive than the Wittgenstein approach. For Wittgenstein, philosophy is a kind of therapy. For Austin, philosophy is the scientific study of uses of language, or very rigorous study of dictionaries law codes and so forth, in order to understand how, how we can answer questions like what is a promise or what is an excuse or um, um, even what is a meaning. And then, so this is the, the British approach. Not much logic here, a lot of fancy footwork with language. Uh, very witty, um, but it, it's not logical, but it is it is trying to be rigorous in its way. Now, Quine is trying to be rigorous by using logic. So Quine is still following much of what the Vienna Circle believed, namely that what the content of science can be logically formalized, and anything which can't be logically formalized is, and logically formalized using first-order logic, is to be junked, basically. So logic is the center of philosophy. We can still do metaphysics. He, he used the phrase ontological commitment. Uh, to do metaphysics is to study the ontological commitments of scientific theory. And so the answer to the question, what is there, is everything that we believe when we believe the propositions of the scientific. That's the answer to the question, what is there is everything. How do we know what everything is? Well, we see what scientific theories force us to believe in. And believe in means quantify over. So this is a logical sense of belief. And now, there's no real guarantee that everything that we need to quantify over to do science should be such that the propositions of the, of the sciences that do the quantification are consistent with each other. And some people took Quine's theory and said, well, there are ontological commitments which are non-scientific, which are equally good. So there are ontological commitments made by people in tribes in different distant countries who believe in spirits or witches. Or, uh, and their, their ontological commitments can be studied too. Um, or you can study the ontological commitments of a robot. Now, 
this, this is Chisholm. So I think Chisholm really was the father of analytic metaphysics. And other people who uh, made important contributions are people like David Lewis and David Armstrong, Kit Fine, um, Jonathan Lowe. Um, they did what Quine did not do. They put metaphysics back into its proper place as the first philosophy. So metaphysics is the most important branch of philosophy. We can't do any other kind of philosophy unless we do metaphysics. Metaphysics is hard, but it's a... a, a uh, uh, there is a project of doing metaphysics in a rigorous way so that we can make actual progress. And I believe that these people did make actual progress. They're all dead except Kit Fine. So Kit Fine is now the greatest living philosopher. <laughs> That's his logical argument. Um, so then the question is what next? And then what, what is next? Um, uh, is uh, is not the topic of this class, really. All right, so let's go back to Aristotle. Um, the idea is that there is a hierarchy of universals with categories at the top level universals, and for the moment you can think of categories as being things like things. Uh, or substance, which is for Aristotle the most important category, and then secondary categories, categories like process or event or action, uh, which we'll talk about more in a minute. The important thing for the moment is that these are hierarchically organized. So there is a top level, and then there are, which is the most general level, containing categories like substance, and then there are lower levels containing categories like animal, man, or human, um, so, now the the, the the beginnings of the applied ontology in biology um, came about because people started to understand in very great detail the hierarchical structure of the realm of biological processes and other biological entities such as cells and molecules. So this is a tiny fragment of the gene ontology. You don't need to read it or even know about it, but I will be referring to it just occasionally today. The gene ontology is an attempt to understand biology as a hierarchical classification of more and less general universals with biological process, one of the three most general universals, so the equivalent of Aristotle's category. And... Porphyrius created the first ever hierarchical representation of, of category in a commentary on Aristotle's uh, work. So we have substance, and there are two kinds of substance, the corporeal and the incorporeal. And then a, a corporeal substance is a corpus, and there are two kinds of corpus, namely animal or animate and non-animate. And then animate corpuses, there are two kinds, the sensible ones, the ones that can sense, and the insensible ones. There are two kinds, and the sensible ones are called animals. And there are two kinds of animals, namely the irrational ones and the rational ones. And then human beings are rational animals. And then there are two kinds of uh, rational animals, and I think that says Plato. Uh, so I think that's probably a misprint, that they didn't have a print in those days. Uh, now Linnaeus, who was the first, or one of the first, um, well, he was actually at the interface between the modern scientific biologists and Aristotelians, so he was an Aristotelian. He was seeped in Aristotelian categorization, and he used the Aristotelian method in order to classify living things into more general types like mammalia, mammals, primates, anthropoids, and so on. He did this for other things. He did it for diseases also. And this became a part of um, 
mainstream biology. So biologists, until very recently, would think in these terms as a matter of course. They're still thinking these terms, uh, but they don't now see them as forming permanent uh, and intelligible universals into which all organisms have to fit. Rather, they see them as, as being subject to a process of evolution. And they're much more interested in understanding how they evolved from earlier uh, kinds of, uh, of organisms than they are in understanding the nature of the organism species which they form. Um, now, modern day biology, I think, is overwhelmingly dominated by a view of species according to which species are populations of organisms. These populations of organisms start when there is some speciation event. So, for instance, two po one population gets split. Uh, a river, the half of it is on one side of the river. The other half is on another side of the river. The river gets wider, so the two populations become separated. And then they, they become subject to independent development. And eventually, it becomes clear to everybody that they are two separate species. But, in fact, they were two separate species already when they first got separated by the river. It's just that there was no way of knowing that fact until you saw how evolution took separate courses across the two populations. So, all of these things here represent populations. Now, the population of animals is a very big population. The population of birds is, is a much smaller population. The population of canaries is a smaller population, too. In the future, we may not have canaries. That population may die out. Now, I think that that population view of species is correct. I have to think that because I think that established science is the best place we have to look in order to find answers to questions like this. But I still think that there are aspects of our understanding of species which rest upon older Aristotelian ideas. And so I think that there is something about canaries, for instance, which makes canaries different from other kinds of birds. And that might be expressed in terms of a certain DNA pattern which all canaries share in common and which differentiates them from all other birds. So even though I believe that species are populations of organisms, I still believe that the idea that there is a differentia, a specific difference, which separates instances in one population from instances in neighboring populations, I still believe that that idea bears fruit, carries weight. All right, so we can still, because there are these specific differences, we can still look at hierarchies of organisms in a broadly Aristotelian way. So we have canary, and the, the canaries can sing, canaries are yellow, these are um, accidents uh, of canaries or attributes of canaries, we'll uh, talk about that kind of terminology later. So the canary is a kind, each canary is a bird, canaries are a kind of bird. All birds have wings, can fly and have feathers, that's a characteristic of birds. And if we know that something is a canary, then we know it can fly, because we know that all canaries are birds. Everything which holds a birds will hold of all the instances underneath birds, and of all the, the universals or species or categories of those instances. For instance, the universal canary. And similarly, we know that birds are animal, animals, so we know that birds breathe and we know that birds move. Now, this is the Aristotelian approach. So for Aristotle, we know there are canaries, we know there are birds, we know there are animals, we can see them and we observe them. And, um, and we know that they are fixed, universal, that they will never change. Aristotle did not understand about evolution. There will always be birds, there will always be canaries, there will always be animals. And there will always be fish. And fish are animals, but they're not birds. 
Now, the, this is a kind of inference machine. You, if you know that something is a canary, you know a lot of things about it already, just from that fact. And the, the Aristotelian view of categorization is a very useful inference machine. It's a very useful way of organizing our observations, organize, organizing our theories in order to uh, do science. That's why Linnaean biology, the Linnaean classification, survived for so long. It still survives today um, for zoo doing zoology and botany and, and uh, uh, nowadays for doing uh, even very high-powered uh, genomics-based biology. You still organize genomics information in terms of whether the genome that you decoded was a mouse genome or a rat genome or a fly genome. So people still use this Aristotelian way of organizing their, their knowledge of reality. Now, I would say, as a realist ontologist, that the reason why this is so efficient and so useful and so long-lasting is because the world is organized in the Aristotelian way. So being is hierarchical. Being is such that there are real regularities captured in these genus species trees, real relations of similarity between all canaries or between all birds or between all animals which biologists can understand, and which they under can understand in a hierarchical way. Now, we can understand these trees not merely in this way, but also in this way. So all canaries are birds, all birds are animals. And um, in the Renaissance, there was a... Um, uh, a, a Renaissance man, uh, probably the classical Renaissance man, Alberti, who devised something called Alberti's Grid, which was designed to help painters paint accurate representations of complex scenes. So the idea is that you use the grid, and you have a, uh, a drawing of the grid down here, and you look through each cell in the grid, and then you draw what you see in the cell. And then when you take the, uh, when you take the result, it will represent what you see through the grid. Now, the importance of the grid is that it can have different granularities. You may, as here, have, um, I think it's 12, 10 by 10, but you might have 4 by 4 grids or 8 by 8 grids. And now what you see when you look through a 4 by 4 grid should be the same as what you see by, when you look through a 10 by 10 grid. But when you do science or when you do ontology, then you may see different things through different grids, even though the grids are all transparent. So the grid may be mo molecule size. If you look through a molecular sized grid, in other words, each cell in the grid corresponds to one molecule, you'll see something very different from what you will see if you just have one cell and you just see a whole scene or a whole limb or a whole lung. Now, the problem with, uh, with this, all of this Aristotelian approach, which I've been uh, talking about as if it were still unproblematic. So, all of this is unproblematic. Um, and all of this is still dealing with substance universals. So, th this summarizes the view. There are instances which are actual organisms, which you can count. And then there are uh, species and genera, or universals at different levels of, uh, of generality, leading all the way up to substances at the top. So substance universals are the most important universals, both for Aristotle and for modern-day biology. It's organisms which are the heart of modern-day biology. Now... I'm coming to the, the problem with this view in a minute, but let me just say something about Aristotle's category theory. So I, I've said all along that Aristotle's central category is substance. The central examples of the central category are organisms, people. So we understand the nature of reality because we understand organisms and the world 
is divided into substances which stand in relations of similarity, which are like the relations of similarity between different organisms. Now, he, he talked actually very little about what the other kinds of substances might be. So he has a funny theory of artifacts, according to which artifacts, because they have parts which are not uh, substances, or which are substances, cannot themselves be substances. So I think a substance, a chair, is a, just as good a substance as an organism. But for Aristotle, artifacts like chairs were problematic for substances. Now, there are substances, but these substances have accidents. So there are substances, and we know intelligible things about substances. So if we know that a substance is, an a, is a, a mammal, then we know that it's also an animal. It will always be an animal. It's, it's part of the nature of a mammal to be an animal. It's not an accident that a mammal is, a, is an animal. It's necessary that a mammal is an animal. But there are things which hold of substances by accident or per accident. So, a substance may be red, or it may be hot, or it may be suntanned, or it may be spinning. That's an accident. Maybe waving its arm, maybe speaking. All of those are accidents. It's not necessary for a substance to be waving its arm. And so, Aristotle divided the world into substances and accidents. And he held that just as substances form hierarchies of less and more general universals, the substances are, are the particular instances. They are instances of substance universals like animal, mammal, human, and so on. So accidents are instances of accident universals. Like color, for instance. So this... Well, his shirt, yeah, his pullover is red. It, that's the, it's actually quite a good match. Um, so the token redness in his shirt, shirt pullover over there is an individual accident of his pullover. And it's an individual accident of a certain type, namely it's an R20 and so on, which is a sub type or sub-universal of the scarlet universal, which is a sub-universal of the red universal, which is a sub-universal of the color universal, which is a sub-universal of the category called quality. And this is an accidental category. And it's accidental because you can change your color. So these are the nine accidental categories along with the unit, the, the central category of some. There is substance, quantity, quality, relation, place, time, status, habitus, action, and passion. And they each correspond to a single question. Um, so I, my Latin is not very good, but I'll do my best. So what is it? That means what is its nature? In other words, what is the universal under which it falls? How many is it? How is it? What quality does it have? Uh, to what is it? So, is it the mother of somebody? Or where is it? When is it? How is it? What, what is its uh, place? I guess. No, what is its. Sitting. No, I thought sitting was habitus. Uh, no, habitus is like, what is it? Armed or not armed is habitus. Okay, so how is it sitting? How is it situated? How is it situated in the sitting? How, how, how is it armed? Is it armed with a yeah, sword? With a hat, yeah. Or with a hat? Uh, what's it doing? And what's being done to it? So they are the nine accidental categories. And there are hierarchies for each one of those things. So there is a hierarchy of action. And the topmost node of the hierarchy of action is action. And then as you go down, you get more and more um, specific, cat uh, universal, in the category of action. 
So just to repeat, these are the, actually there are 10 categories, nine accidental categories. There, there, there are different lists. And in some lists, it's slightly short. Uh, but there are 10 categories, one substance category, and nine accidental categories. And so, um, and so it's as if the substance is the bearer of these dangly bits, which are the accidents which attach to the substance and then fall away when they change color or when they're no longer related to him but rather related to somebody else and so on. Now there are four different kinds of entities in this ontology which we'll call Aristotle 1.0. There are substance tokens or universe, uh, sorry, substance tokens or particulars, accident particulars, and then substance types or universals and accident, accident types or universals. And so this is what is called Aristotle's ontological square. And um, so there are particulars, there are universals, there are substantial particulars like me, and there are universal particular, uh, uni substantial universals like man, and there are uh, accidental particulars like my headache and accidental universals like headache. Now, 20th century philosophers have tended to deviate from this by having thinner ontologies. So, if you hold, as Wittgenstein did, and as Russell did in their logical atomist phases, and as David Armstrong did in one brief phase in his career, maybe longer than brief. Um, if you hold that predicate logic is the window on reality, or the mirror of reality, so that the way to capture reality is to use kind of predicate logic, which is certainly something that Quine held, then you only really accept two kinds of entity. That that all particulars are individuals which is normally taken to mean that they are substantial. So Nelson Goodman, for instance, thought that all particulars were thingy particulars. Um, and all the attributes are accidental. In other words, they correspond to predicates rather than to universals in the category of substance. Now, what does that mean? Um, so... For Aristotle, there are two kinds of predication. There, are, there is predication in the category of substance. When you say John is a man, man, so John is an instance of the category or universal man. That's predication in the category of substance. And then there's predication in the category of accident, where you say John is hungry, or John is blue, or John is running away. Now, standard predicate logic, standard analytic philosophy, standard Frege, does not accept this distinction between substan substantial and accidental universals. And really, they, they approximate to a view according to which all predication is predication in the category of attributes or qualities. Um, and we'll come back to this. This is a, a very important um, understanding of the way logic gets to represent reality. Now, many uh, analytic philosophers of the 20th century, but not David, L David Armstrong, not Jonathan Lowe, not Kit Fine. Um, I don't know about David Lewis. Um, held that they were nominalists. So they held that the only things which exist are particulars. Now, this has tremendous consequences if you believe that the realm of universals is something which makes everything in the universe understandable in the first place. That there are real similarities between instances of the same universals in virtue of which we can do science, we can understand each other, we can formulate general plans about what we're going to do tomorrow because there are things like breakfasts and trains 
and uh, train conductors and so forth, which are regularly similar to each other uh, in ways which allow knowledge. If you, if you, if you are a nominalist, it seems to me, you just you can't understand knowledge because there is no similarity. Um, so it, we shouldn't really use terms like this man. We should just, this, ugh. <laughs> Even this is already too similar to this, this, uh, to lend credence to the idea that there is no real similarity in nature in virtue of which we can classify, for instance, words and distinguish the instance of, or the token of one word in one sentence from the token of the same word in another sentence. For a nominalist, there is no such thing as the same word. And so it seems that nominalists preclude the very possibility of intelligible speech. And um, I could go on, but I've never ever understood why a intelligent person could be a nominalist. And then there are process metaphysicians who, like Heraclitus and uh, Whitehead in some moods, um, who think that there are no substances but only events or accidents or only processes. Uh, so this is small ontology. And I also find it incoherent. But it's enough that nominalism is incoherent to prove that process metaphysics is incoherent. <laughs> now, Aristotle 1.0 does the ontological square quite well, but as, as it happens, I think we need more. So uh, Jonathan Lowe also had a four-category ontology, as I think you uh, know. But we need more than four categories. Um, this is a category that we need, although I believe that you can fit this into the substance category if you do it properly. So, if we are to understand things like chairs, or peepholes, or rooms, or doorways, or mouths, uh, or digestive tracts, then we need to understand that there are entities in reality which do not are not made of matter. They are cavities, which allow matter to pass through. For instance, the doorway allows people to pass through when they are leaving or entering the room. So you might call these negative parts. So you, this is an interesting uh, picture of shoes, some people think. Um, <laughs> so all of these are examples of holes which I believe are needing to be accounted for in a good ontology of what there is. And Aristotle didn't do holes. So Aristotle's theory of place is very strange. It, it seems to be coherent in its own terms, but this would not be, this would not count as a place for Aristotle. Um, all right, so for Aristotle, a place is the interior boundary of the surrounding body. So everything that is a place, ha everything that is in a place has to be surrounded by another body. And the, the, if a fish is swimming in the sea, then the water surrounding the fish has an interior boundary where it hits the fish and moves around as the fish moves around. That interior boundary is what Aristotle means by place. And so Aristotle has to hold that the atmosphere, uh, and indeed water, has to, has to be such as to have interior boundaries which can serve as places. Now we know when we understand something about the atmosphere in modern day chemical terms that it doesn't have an interior boundary. It's a lot of molecules of air which are bombarding against our exterior boundary, which is also not quite so smooth as we like to think. Um, so Aristotle did not have room for holes. Um, so this, the hole in the ground, for instance, the, it doesn't fit anywhere in Aristotle's ontology. And the distinction between two kinds of boundaries, fiat boundaries, like the, the lid, which is not made of matter on a hole, which does not have a physical lid, and bona fide boundaries, which, such as here, the physical wall of the hole in the ground, 
that distinction also does not play a role in Aristotle, which is why he gets artifacts wrong, because the, he doesn't understand the distinction between these two kinds of things. That's one of the reasons why he gets artifacts wrong. All right. Um, so bona fide read boundaries would be things like the surface of somebody's skin. Fiat boundaries would be things like the boundaries of postal districts, boundaries of mountains, um, which make it difficult for us to know where a mountain starts. And the reason why it's difficult is because there is no bona fide boundary here. And the reason why there is no bona fide boundary is because a mountain is not a substance, it's not an object. It's not movable, it's not a thing with its own boundary which separates it from other things. Uh, and then there are fiat boundaries called brain regions, for instance, and then there are bona fide boundaries in the brain also. So this leads us to Aristotle 1.5. Um, we add holes, and thereby we get the distinction between fiat and bona fide boundaries. So this room is a hole. The doorway is a hole. All artifacts involve, well, we don't need to talk about that now, we'll do that later. Environments are holes. An organism lives in an environment because the environment is a place in the whole sense, where whole is with an H, in which the organism can live and typically from which the organism can leave and re-enter. All right, now we'll have another break for questions, comments. So something you said earlier that struck me as odd is um, when speciation occurs. So why should I buy that the organism becomes a new species when the river widens? Um, because when you come back and check a thousand years later, you see that they're not capable of interbreeding anymore. Sure, but so I should think that they have the inability to breed when the river widens? Of course. Well, at some point, they evolved to the point where they did not have the ability to breed anymore. Uh, breed anymore. And so at that point, we can say, with evidence, these are two distinct species. Now, we, the question then is, when did those two distinct species first begin to exist? Now, what's your hypothesis? Um... I mean, at least for a lot of species, I would think it would have something to do about their inability to breed, but that's going to be a fact about their biology. Yeah, but let's stick with the, the, those kinds of organisms which are specie, uh, where, where the species differences are marked by incapacity to breed. Um, so let, let's make life easy for us. Well, I feel like that incapacity shouldn't depend upon their, you know, the river white. No, no. The reason why they can't breed is because they have evolved so that they don't like each other anymore. They don't. Sure. They don't want to breed. <laughs> they they don't fit together anymore. There, there are all kinds of reasons why they can't breed. Uh, they're like cats and dogs. Sure. But maybe I misheard you because I thought that you said that they become two species when the river widens. They become two species when they first split. So the, the, imagine that we have a, a, a small town around a river with penguins or something living in it, and I don't suppose penguins don't live. Riverine animals, but never mind. So the penguins on the left side of the river and the penguins on the right side of the river can breed. They go backwards and forwards, but then the river starts to widen. And at some point, human, sorry, penguin traffic across the river ceases. Um, so you, you, you agree that, that there will occur a point like that? I yeah, think that but is not, the, but, but not that at that point they are two species. Okay, so at that point, I think they become two species. And that's also standard biology. That's what biologists say. What happens is that they then start to breed only among each other, and they're subject more and more to differential uh, environmental impacts. And eventually, those biological forces will bring about phenotypic differences. They will, they will like different things. They will, they will have slightly different bodies, and eventually those phenotypic differences will compound and compound until they can't interbreed anymore. 
for all kinds of reasons. All right? Now, the question is, when did they become two species? Now, if you say that they were one species a week before they couldn't breed anymore, then you're going to have uh, a, a logical transitivity problem. So, the let's say it all happens in 2010. So in 2009, they still could interbreed in principle if they had penguin boats. Um, but in 2010, they can't, even with boats, they couldn't interbreed. But the 2010 penguins can interbreed with the 2009 penguins. The 2009 penguins on the right-hand side. 2009 penguins on the left-hand side can interbreed with the 2009 penguins on the right-hand side. So assuming that interbreeding is transitive, then the 2010 penguins can interbreed with the 2009 penguins who can interbreed with the two on the left, who can interbreed with the 2010 penguins on the left. And so by transitivity of interbreeding, the 2010 penguins on the right can interbreed with the 2010 penguins on the left, which was against the hypothesis. Therefore, by reductio ad absurdum, they have to be two different species already in 2009. And then it goes all the way back to the original speciation event, which is when the two populations split. That's what biologists say. So this is a case where something can be true, even though no one can know it's true until a thousand years later. But there are, there are many examples in biology like that. I could even think of one if you really stress me. Yes? So interbreeding is not transitive. Right? I know, I was using a simple biology. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I, I guess I'll be the guy to make it not easy because I think interbreeding is a really bad version of speciation. A bad what? That's a bad way to demarcate speciation. Well, it doesn't work for bacteria and things, but it, it was standard for a long time. Now we have other m more um, molecular biology-oriented methods for speciation. And they're, they, they're, we have several methods which don't yield the same results always. So the, the, the theory of speciation is not in good shape. However, I think that it's orthodoxy today to say that there are speciation events and that a classic speciation event occurs when a population splits into two and when the two halves of the population undergo a different evolutionary course. And the speciation event creates two distinct species even before evolution gives rise to the phenotypic differences which bring about consequences like inability to intervene. So I'm pretty sure that that's orthodox. I haven't seen any alternative to this. And not because of the transitivity of interbreeding, but because of arguments like that. Uh, yes? So uh, I'm a little concerned about the whole identity. Yeah? Um, so I guess just holds don't seem like entities to me any more than missions to act are entities, the absences of things are not things themselves. Um, so I'm just worried that there's a kind of promiscuous use of entity or something like that going on. In, in time. I mean, I, I, I get that we can, you, you talk about holes as like, I, I think of them as like shorthands for talking about the things that, that you know, surround that area or something. Okay, so... The whole as an entity itself, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, so if, if you look at the... I don't know what's the name for it. Um, um, so if you have an airport, there are zones of three-dimensional space above the airport which have different legal statuses. So military can only fly through one box and landing planes have to go through this other box and planes which are passing through but not landing at this airport have to go through this other box. So there are uh, well demarcated regions of space, not just above airports actually, but everywhere around the, uh, the planet. Some of them even have different weather. So some of them have military weather, and some of them have civilian weather. Um, now, what is your ontology of these regions of space? They're not collections of atmospheric molecules. What do you, what's your ontology of space in general? Space which fills up most of the universe without doing very much. Do you have a view on that? Yeah. Um, I see the case for all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That doesn't seem like an argument for spaces. Convinced. Convinced. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, we just need a procedure, right? We just need to socially degrade a procedure for delim delimiting, right? Air. Uh, yeah, no, no it's not air, air that we're delimiting. We're not delim delimiting atmospheric molecules, anyway. No, regions, but, right? Yeah, I mean, regions of space. So, do this you is not an argument for these things existing, it's just an argument for that we can share a procedure for figuring out are, am I in a region that I'm allowed to be in or, or what. Okay, so actually I believe that there are both holes and regions of space and that the hole and the region of space are two different things. And that's because the hole can move around. So the, the, the hull of a ship, the cargo hole of a ship, can move around when the ship moves through different regions of space. So you can have a hole which is in different regions of space at different times. So I'm doubly... Uh, in, in, in a bad way from your point of view, I guess. Um, I, um, I think that, well, I, I promised myself I would not draw on applied ontology in order to make arguments in this class. But I could draw on applied ontology by saying it's really very useful if you're doing <laughs> an ontology of ship cargo um, uh, loading if you have holes in your ontology. Uh, and I can repeat that argument over and over again for the, the anatomy of the digestive tract and thoracic cavity. And so, so anatomists really believe that there are holes. So let me see if I can give you a philosophical argument. Um, so so I'm happy with the pragmatic argument, but I... I, I well, then maybe I'll just rest on, on my law. <laughs> so my, if I did do a philosophical argument, it would be of the form um, that we want, as I, in my view anyway, and you may disagree with this general desire, we want to have an understanding of reality, metaphysics in other words, which will do justice not merely to what scientists Say, but also to what commonsensical uh, common sense would say. Now, common sense, I think, believes that there are things like holes in your pocket or in your jacket, which people's buttons are inserted when you fasten the buttons of your jacket, or in your um, uh, shoes. Uh, so. So there, there, in fact, there are two different kinds of holes in your shoe. There is a hole that you put your foot in, and there's a hole where the, the rain leaks from the bottom. Uh, so we do seem to have different kinds of holes which populate our commonsensical world. And therefore, a metaphysical view of reality which said, oh, there are no such things as holes, would seem to have the counter commonsensical conclusion, which is that you can never have a hole in your shoe. So I rest my case. Yeah? I have a similar concern uh, about this ontology because it seems to me that uh, some of the things that are included in this ontology are for philosophical reasons, like for instance the universals, and other like artifacts are included just for pragmatical reasons. And I'm not saying that there are chairs or tables, but I'm just saying that. Uh, they do not belong to natural categories, and so they shouldn't be included in the Okay, good. So, I, Aristotle 1.5 differs from Aristotle 1.0 precisely because it tries to do justice to artifacts. And the most important kind of artifact in ancient Greece and today, for many purposes, so we're, we are doing a little bit of pragmatics here, but I'll explain why it's okay in a minute. Are uh, real estate, parcels of real estate, both within buildings and on the ground where the buildings are built. So the, the real estate in New York City is, is worth $17 trillion. That's, that's nearly as much as the national debt. Really important. Um, now, you can't understand real estate without fiat boundaries. And I introduced the terminology of fiat boundaries when I was working with geographers. We were trying to understand the ontology of real estate, which I think is a philosophical question, not a applied question. So this would be a good question, even if you didn't ever care about doing applied ontology. So what is the ontology of real estate? We know that there are boundaries in nature, for instance, coastlines. 
uh, boundaries of fields to me were the fences. Farmers put fences around fields. But many real estate boundaries are not real boundaries in that sense. They're not natural boundaries, and they're not constructed physical boundaries. So what do we say? And in the geographic literature, before I came along, they used to call them conceptual boundaries. I, now, I find that philosophically incoherent to say that they're conceptual boundaries. He might find it coherent, but I find it incoherent. It's not, it's not the concept. Uh, and it turns out that the medical terminologies that people use also uh, think that places are conceptual. And I, I think places are not conceptual. Places are real things. So St. Peter's Square or St. Piazza San Marco picture I had. They are real entities. And we need to put them in our metaphysics. Um, they're not conceptual entities. It doesn't make sense to me. So that's why I coined the term here. And now geographers use it, so it's caught on. They too realized that they were not conceptual in any use. Yep? Yeah, uh, if we treat ontology as a, as a whole, as one thing, is it possible that one ent um, an entity could be categorized in in two different um, accidents. So every entity, or every substance, will have, at any given time, many accidents. So it will have a temperature, it will have a color, or maybe multiple colors of different parts of the entity, and it will have a weight, it will have a height. Uh, so yes, it's, it's not only possible, it's also almost always the case. So it's very hard to find a substance which would only have one accident. And certainly organisms have many. Both in Aristotelian terms and in more modern terms, which I'm coming to in a minute. Okay, any, yes? So I have a question about the uh, process ontology. So you explain yeah. about the process ontology. So, on, so you're saying that if you, if you only accept the uh, particular accident category, then you, you will defend the process ontology. So, I'm saying that pros, there is a school of thought called process ontology, which has a few quite famous members. So Whitehead is one, uh, Heraclitus is one. I guess there were other Greeks who held this view. Uh, the, um, I, I can't remember who in the 20th century were the prominent ones, but there were prominent process metaphysicians. Now, they were, they were trying to distance themselves completely from Aristotle. They wouldn't use Aristotelian terminology at all. They were trying to be modern and clever. My, my thought is that the defender of that category would be trope theory. Would be trope theory. Trope, trope theory. theory. Good. And okay. I, good. Good. You're right. So, the the if we go back to that picture, I, I trope theory would be explained processly. Yep. Processes in terms of a sequence of terms, but not like. Process. Yeah. Good. So. If we consider the possible occupants of this box, then trope nominalism would be a good example. So it's not only process metaphysics which shines the light only in this box. It's also trope, trope theories. So you're right. Maybe theories? Uh, I don't want to get into that at this stage. Uh, yes? Um. So you, you've said a couple times that uh, substances exist, and you're, always, you're also going to allow for things like uh, the social constructed to exist, like money. Yep. Um, would you would you characterize a, a physicist, perhaps, uh, who came to you and said, um, "Look, money doesn't actually exist. What really exists is just this on the fundamental and microscopic level." Would you characterize them as disputing you, just quibbling in terms, like you're using the word? I think it really depends on the physicist in question. So there are philosophers who embrace a physical reductionism, which, which really does say that there are only cl clusters of microparticles or something like that, or, or regions of the quantum mechanical wave or something like that. 
There are other physicists who are perfectly happy with the idea that they are talking about reality at a certain level of granularity, but that there is reality, uh, precisely because there is reality at that level of granularity, which includes the reality of brains and people who create cultural artifacts, like money, uh, that those cultural artifacts exist too. Um, that I find the second group more friendly than the first group. So the um, existence, in the sense, is going to be on par throughout the granularity. If I were to say capture this with a quantifier, it would be the same quantifier? So the, the, this is a, a, uh, a, a question which is very similar to questions which arise when you think about the Vienna Circle dream to have a unified science, a single collection of axioms which would capture all sciences. I do not believe that that dream is realizable. There is a weaker dream which says let's have an, a, a collection of ontologies which would be consistent with each other and which would cover not merely the domains of all the sciences but also the domains of, for instance, cultural artifacts like money. I... Um, I... I talk, actually in the book too, we talk about those ontologies being like telescopes or microscopes or different windows on reality. And I'm, I have some slides in a minute which talk in that way. So Alberti's grid is a, is a good example. So the ontologies are different ways of viewing reality which, give, which shine a light or allow a view of reality on different levels of granularity or on different levels of physicality, if you like but they are all transparent to reality. Now, of course, you could have an ontology which, is, which includes t terms like witchcraft or uh, magic, um, and those would be then ontologies which were not transparent to reality because there is nothing to which they correspond. So there are limits. Uh, when language goes on holiday, then, yep. Uh, I have a question about um, whether there are any limits to our intuition of PF boundaries. So, for example, I could just arbitrarily decide to talk about this room plus one inch out the door, one inch and a quarter, one inch, two inch, and a half, two inch, and a half. I could talk about the boundary, the makeup, make up some boundary. Like, is this room I think we'd probably door? say that you, you're, you're allowing language to go on holiday. Okay. Give me a real case which you think is problematic rather than a made up case. So, the less controversial cases to me seem to be things that involve fairly hard and fast institutions uh, and geographic yep. boundaries and things like that. So, I'm not really worried about those. I'm, I'm more worried about the principle of, like, are there any inherent restrictions on where we could set the yeah, so boundaries or... Let's talk totally about, unlimited and there yeah. are infinite yeah, yeah. Uh, let's talk about um, yeah. something which is at the level of a, of a short-lived institution. So let's suppose you have a football game. I don't know anything about football, but let's suppose you have a football game and you have a, the coach who is dividing the, the field, is it called? Um, <laughs> this is American football? Yeah, okay. I thought I'd try and be. <laughs> um, anyway, so you divide up the field into different zones, just for this pur purpose of this particular game, or even just for the purpose of this particular play, um, then you would be creating fiat boundaries of a very short-lived nature, and that seems to me to be perfectly uh, correctly analyzed in terms of this zone which has been created for this play, or whatever they would say. Yes. Yep. Uh, while we're on break, can you tell us the title or give us the citation for that article you mentioned about the Vienna Circle? You said you proved that it was always going to fail or something like that. Yes. What's it called? Uh, I think it's called... Um, um, so the one short verse is called The Concept of A Priorism. And it was published in the Austrian Economics Newsletter. So it's also a popular version. But there is a more 
technical version, which I believe was published in the Journal of the History of Philosophy. And it has a title like Aristotle Menga Mises. Something like that. I was trying to prove it wouldn't work for economics, where you would think it would work. But the ge argument is completely general that that's the argument that is expressed. And if that's not right, then just email me. And I, I'll, if you email me, I can send it to everybody. Um, all right, so let's continue. So, Aristotle 2016. Scientific realism cover, co cover with realism about the everyday world. Aristotle himself got neither of those things right for different reasons. So, we have folk biology and we have DNA. Um, our understanding of the DNA corresponds to this. So, this is this. And this, this is the result of doing scientific experimentation with all kinds of quantified uh, results of measurement and uh, very careful assays and so forth. But this corresponds to what we know commonsensically. Uh, so, and they both relate to the same reality. So they're transparent partitions of the same reality. Well, this is a much finer grid. This is a coarser grid. And they're all true. So it's true that an organism is a totality of atoms. I, I would say more about that, but let, let's just assume that that's all that needs to be said. It's also true that an organism is a totality of molecules. It's true that an organism is a totality of cells. And it's true that an organism is a single unitary substance. All of those things are true, if you understand them correctly. So there are multiple transparent partitions of different levels of granularity. And indeed, the substances and accidents reappear both at the level of organisms and at the level of molecules. Because molecules have quality, accidents. They have the, the molecular counterpart of things like weight, uh, functions, binding properties, and so forth. Just as organisms at the much coarser grain have qualities of different sorts. Um, so there may be, at the level of quantum mechanics, uh, uh, a departure from the substance accident Aristotelianism that I have been expanding, but no one understands quantum mechanics anyway. And so we're not going to worry too much about whether that is the case. Um, so this I call perspectivalism. There are different perspectives on one and the same reality. There are coarse grain perspectives. There are fine grain perspectives. And, uh, and BFO is designed to be compatible with multiple different perspectives. So you don't need to embrace all of BFO. If you really want to be a process ontologist, if you want just to have a process-focused perspective, then you can just ignore the continuing part of BFO. All right. So this is an example of a really nice partition of reality. Um, this is another example of a really nice partition of reality. This is the gene ontology again. Um, so they, these are interesting because they give us a view of the hierarchical order of the species and genera uh, within the corresponding domains. All right, now there is the big problem which I warned you about earlier. And some of you may have guessed already what the problem is. Um, the problem is ostriches, which can't fly, but they are birds. Now, if we are, if we Aristotelians are right that there are these similarities in nature, in virtue of which we can define nature into universals at different levels of generality. And everything which is true of a universe at a higher level will be true of all the instances of all the sub-universes at lower levels. Then ostriches should be able to fly. And they can't. So that means that we, if, we in, if we use the, um, the Aristotelian hierarchy to draw inferences, then we will make a false inference. Uh, we will infer that the ostrich can both fly and not fly. 
which is not good. So another problem which is related actually is that very many features of reality are not divided into universals which we can divide from their neighboring universals by means of discrete partitions. So if we're dealing with molecules then, or atoms, then we can divide oxygen atoms from hydrogen atoms, and there are no things between them. There are no uh, uh, mutant uh, oxy oxygen-hydrogen atoms which lie between oxygen and hydrogen. But there are mutants in the field of colors, for instance. So the color, the color space is a continuum. It's not divided like this. It's divided like this. And that does not correspond to the way Aristotle wanted to see the world of universal being divided. And um, so we have the ostrich problem and we have the continuous variation problem. So continuous variation problem arises not just for colors, it arises for heights, temperatures, weights, very many other physical properties. Species. Species. Yeah. And in the world, no, I, I would dispute that. What I would say is that the world of species, when you're dealing with things like bacteria, is much more like this than it should be if bacteria were well behaved. Um, but it's not completely continuous because we, we're still dealing with molecules after all. So the DNA is still made up of molecules where we can uh, distinguish the corresponding uh, elements. So chemistry is still going to save the day even for bacteria. All right. Now, what the first thing to notice is that we never get continuous boundaries where we're dealing with information systems. So when you classify things in your uh, laptop, for instance, you might classify things by putting different kinds of things into different folders. And if you're classifying the books in your library, then you would have the counterpart of different kinds of folders which are organized hierarchically. You can't see the organization, the hierarchical organization here, but there is one. Um, it's a very complicated one because we need to have Spanish books and earth science books being divided in such a way that there are Spanish earth science books and English earth science books, which are earth science books, and then there are Spanish, and so on. It gets very complicated, particularly if you have more than two languages. But still... The important thing is that there's no continuum here. There are no borderline cases because the way the Dewey, class, Dewey Decimal Classification System works is that it forces you to give one single number to every uh, classification element within the system as a whole. So it's a completely crisp classification. And interestingly, it's always up to date because from the perspective of the Dewey classification system, books only exist when they get their classification number. Um, so, in other words, you can't discover that you've missed something. You can't say, oh, this classification system is wrong because there is this book here that we didn't get. That's not case of wrongness, it's just the next piece of work that you have to do to add the book to the classification system, or to add the category which this book represents to the classification system, which is of course a harder thing to do. All right, so now I think this will throw light on Kant, first of all. When you are creating a classification system by projecting from your thought out into the world, as for instance when you create the Dewey Decimal System for classifying books, then you must create a system which is made of discrete units, discrete classes, discrete types. For obvious reasons, the, the finite mind of human beings can't cope with a continuum-dense classification because we don't have enough uh, room in our brains for anything which is the same size as a continuum. 
So all constituted or constructed systems are finite and made of discrete classes. Now, the world, on the other hand, is made of continua all over the place, all many different kinds of continuum. Even at the molecular level, there are all kinds of qualities and of molecules which are, uh, vary continuously rather than vary according to discrete classes. Now, what this means, I think, is that we need two kinds of representations. We need representations in terms of classes, and then we need ways of representing those attributes of the instances of those classes, which vary continuously, where, where we're not using uh, discrete classes. And the, 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 what we use there is, is the approximations to continuous variation, depending on the number of decimal places we have measurement data for. But the measurement data, then, is always partial. It's always an approximation. If we're dealing with continuous variation, then the measurement data we have can never be precisely accurate. If we're dealing with discrete variation, the data we will have, for instance, this is a cat or this is a jacket, can be completely accurate. All right, now. If we are a database engineer, our classification of books can be completely accurate, even if it gets very, very large. There is no hope of being completely accurate where we're dealing with something which varies continuously. The world of books does not vary continuously, just as the world of atoms does not vary continuously. All right. Now, the Kantian idea is that the species genus hierarchy that we find in the world are not really there in the world. We put them there. They are like the Dewey Decimal classification of books. They are inbuilt. So we, we uh, egos, egos like us, are somehow built in a way which we can't understand, in such a way that we create a world of appearance which, is, which classifies things according to the conceptual categories that can favor. So we classify some things as causes, some things as effects, some things as later, some things as earlier, and so on. And um, we are creating the world, then, in something like the way in which the Dewey Decimal Classification System creates the world. So some people call this Midas touch of epistemology, I can't remember. We can't know the world except insofar as we create the categories in virtue of which we know about it. I think it might have been David Armstrong. So, if our database recognizes only two genders, then the world represented in the database is a world in which there are only two genders. Now, I think that that approach to understanding the world is wrong. The, the, the approach that you take to understanding the world has to take account of the fact, A, that our classification systems may be wrong, and B, that some of our classification systems may be trying to deal with continuous variation when there is no, uh, when, when our classifications themselves only give us discrete differentiations. All right, now Aristotelianism, Aristotelianism says, reality in itself is messy. There are continuous variations, there are ostriches, but our categories fit mostly, nonetheless, and I will explain how we deal with that mostly in a minute. Kant says we shape empirical reality in such a way that empirical reality corresponds to the way we categorize, because we've created empirical reality, the reality of, uh, of appearance. It's our creation. Reality can be messy for Aristotelianism because we didn't create it. It can't be messy for Kantianism. I'm talking now about Kantianism as, a, as an evil thing, not about Kant. It was probably an evil thing, too. But... <laughs> <coughs>
All right, now. How do we deal with ostrich? So the idea is, if we do biology, we know all the time that there are going to be counterexamples to virtually anything that we might think holds universal. So biology is full of bell curves. It's full of things which are mostly thus, but then when you get out into the fringes, they turn out to be something quite different. So there are prototypical instances, which are near the middle of the bell curve, and then there are non-standard or fringe instances, which are on the exterior of the bell curve. So sparrows are prototypical instances of bird, and ostriches are fringe instances of bird. So when we're talking about natural categories, rather than the categories created by for instance, the Dewey Decimal Classification, then we have to distinguish between uh, focal instances and fringe instances. And, um, and this is general in biology. But the point is, so th this is a fringe instance, this is a focal instance. And it, it's fringiness uh, it appears clearly on this diagram. And now I'm making its fringiness even more apparent. Now, if we use a coarse-grained partition, and this is a coarse-grained partition, then the fringiness will cause problems because the very same thing will have features which belong to the core instances of this thing, but also features which belong to the core instances of whatever goes in here. And so it will cause problems. So ostriches have features which belong to the core instances of bird. In fact, most of its features are like that. But it will have other features, for instance, the ability to fly, which correspond more to non-birds. But when we, um, when we see a finer grain partition, that's a misprint, you should say, Aristotle 2016. When we go to a finer grain partition, then this thing becomes perfectly, uh, it fits perfectly within this category here the category of those organisms with DNA, which has, through evolution, mutated into DNA, which does not allow flight. Flight. So at the DNA level, this is not a fringe instance anymore. It's perfectly... Uh, it's a focal instance of whatever is in that box. Moreover, unlike Aristotle 1.0, with his shoulder-shrugging philosophy of science, we can actually explain at this level of granularity why it is that this particular organism can't fly. Because we know about the DNA of organisms with flight, that it is such and such, and we know about the DNA of this organism, that it's not such and such. And so we can explain the phenomenon which, at the coarser grained partition level, seemed to be uh, a, a, a big problem. So, the idea is that as science advance, advances, we're not moving away from Aristotle. What we need to do is to interpret Aristotle correctly so that we recognize that there can be substance accident hierarchies at different levels of granularity, and that what appears problematic for the idea of an Aristotelian hierarchy of a sort which supports inference up the hierarchy is problematic only if we stay with one coarse grain or commonsensical or normal non-scientific thinking level of granularity. Uh, we have to move backwards and forwards from normal commonsensical levels of granularity to uh, more fine grain levels of granularity, for instance, at the level of molecular biology. So molecular biology still uses an Aristotelian ontology. Um, I don't think I want to talk about Kant. Uh, so, enough Kant. All right, so any questions before we move on to uh, logic, which I will try to deal with very quickly? Yep. I just have a question about sort of fringe, interest, fringe uh, instances in our applying general terms to the world. Understanding that's messy. But what do you think about a sentence like, this is red, where I'm pointing at something that is on the fringe? True, false? Or, 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 or neither, or respect the matter, but we can't know. So, w w this I would um, suggest to you is going to be context dependent. So, 
So the example w w which I like to use in order to make this clear is the following. You are in a bar and you are thirsty and you have a glass of what used to be beer in front of you which you've just finished. And you say, this glass is empty. But then your girlfriend is a um, health inspector who is examining the glasses in this bar to check for bacterial infection. And she, sa she looks through her microscope and she says, this glass is full of bacterial infection. Now you're both right. But she's using a different partition to the one that you're using. Now the same goes for red. If you, um, if you have a traffic light and it just turned red, but the, the light is broken, so it really turned a kind of gray red, then if you say, oh, it's red, then you're saying something true. But if you're in a paint shop and you're trying to sell paint to somebody who wants red paint, then you're, if you say that is red, then you're doing a dead parrot. <laughs> So, so what is expressed is really dependent on uh, the conceptual frame that the speaker is, is operating I would in. say that vagueness is dependent on context. And contexts are now granularity tied. So vagueness and granularity are two sides of the same coin. The, the, the granularity that you're working with will determine what counts as vague in your context. And I've, I've written on this too, if you're interested. Yep. Um, so you, you mentioned things like natural categories. Um, should I be thinking of those as like natural kinds, or should I be thinking of ways? Like no, natural kind is a good word. Uh, so the the problem is that I want to to apply, apply a broadly Aristotelian kind instance, or universal instance, or type instance, or universal particular by categorical ontology, not merely to nature, to organisms and so forth, but also to artifacts. So I think that there is a kind uh, Volkswagen Pinto. I think there is a kind NFL football team. I guess. I think. Um, which is not something that Aristotle would have liked. But they didn't have very much football or car design in Aristotle's day. Any more? All right, so... I talked already about Wittgenstein um, as having initiated a new... Well, Wittgenstein, I blame. I, he can be blamed for having initiated uh, a new way of doing metaphysics. So we have the Aristotelian way, which says basically that there is regularity in the world which we can apprehend by using categories. And then there is the Kantian way, which says there is no thing that we can know about the world as it really is, but we create a world of appearances which is subject to Kantian categories, roughly. And now, um, there is a third grand metaphysical theory for which Wittgenstein can be blamed, uh, which says that the advances in logic made by Frege and Russell and so forth enable us to, to understand reality in a new way. Uh, to understand what reality really is. And so we all know what propositional logic is. We all know what predicate logic is. We're interested particularly in predicate logic, and we're interested in the propositional forms of predicate logic, um, which are F holds of A, or AFs, and A stands in R to B, or ARs B. Um, so this is Frege's metaphysics. The world is made of functions and objects. And some functions are concepts. And red is a concept, so this object is red, would be a case of F holds of A. A, the, in Frege's land, this would be applying the function is red to the argument A gives the value true. But we don't need to worry about that particular detail. All right, so these are the, um, the people who were responsible for this new way of doing philosophy. And the worst manifestation of this new way of doing philosophy is, is what is called a spreadsheet ontology. So this is the ontology of reality. So there, are a, there is something called A. I'm just, it's some tiny atom or something. 
And A, it holds of A that the H's, J's, N's, O's, and P's. And there is something called B, and it holds of B that the G's, H's, P's, Q's, and U's, and so on. So this is the spreadsheet representation of everything, the whole of the universe will one day be captured in a spreadsheet like this. It will be a bit bigger than the one that you see now. But <laughs> and, of course, we don't think that that will be so, but that's because we're using this horrible, old-fashioned mixture of 20th century physics and common sense and, and, and so on. But the future perfected science, when science really is doing its job properly, will yield a spreadsheet like this. And whether it's a spreadsheet that holds for all time or whether you update it with each unit of time, it doesn't really matter. Um, now, this is what I call phantology, uh, after the F of A. So this is ontology based on fa. Um, and the spreadsheet ontology is the, just the cleanest example of phantology. I used to um, say that even Armstrong never really believed in this because the only place where he published it, and he did publish it, was in French. <laughs> but it turns out that he also published in English, I guess the English original eventually he did publish, so that, even that can't be used as a, an excuse. So I think this is evidence that something has gone very wrong here, that the spreadsheet ontology cannot possibly be a correct ontology of what is. And the idea is that the syntax of first order predicate logic is a mirror of reality. And you can call this linguistic Kantianism. So, it, it, you can take, you know, you can give this a Kantian reading. The Kantian reading would say, when we're doing science, so the only way to know what really is, is to do perfected science. The science of the future when everything is perfect. I, in science. The only way to understand reality is to do perfected science. Perfected science will use first-order predicate logic. And therefore, the only way to understand reality is, to through, is through the spectacles of predicate logic. And when you put together all the propositions of science using the spectacles of predicate logic, you get a spreadsheet like that. And you'd have to have relations in there, too, which would make the spreadsheet complicated. But um, that's, that, that's the Kantian view the Kantian version, that the only way we can know anything is through the spectacles of predicate logic. There is also a, an Aristotelian version, which, which is even more nonsensical, which says that everything in reality is either an individual thing or a predicate. Um, now, it depends what you mean by individual things and predicates, of course, but it seems to me that that is... But that doesn't have a hope of being right. Um, so and I, I, I guess most of this course will be uh, attempting to demonstrate that. All right, so the reason why this whole approach is so bad, uh, and I think Chisholm and the analytic metaphysics renaissance in the late 20th century was the first mainstream movement to break away from this approach. So before Chisholm, if you were a good philosopher, you used logic and you took phantology more or less for granted. I will not mention David Brown in this connection. Um, but other people might want to mention <laughs> um, I, That means he's a good philosopher, remember. I said every good philosopher. All right, now... So the reason why this can't be right is because formal ontology deals with something different from what formal logic deals with. Formal logic deals with truth. Formal ontology deals with entities, the things that there are in reality. Formal logic is concerned with consistency, and formal ontology is concerned with relations and collectives and various, various sorts. So formal ontology deals with formal ontological structures. Formal logic deals with formal logical structures captured within a formal a, th a theory of formal logic. Um, now, one thing that we can think about is what formal means here and whether we are actually dealing with something which deserves to be called formal in the same sense. 
I like to define formal to mean domain neutral. And another way of putting that is to say that something is formal if it holds in all material spheres of reality. Now, the ontological structures which hold in all material spheres of reality are things like part-whole relations. And the formal logical structures which hold in all formal in all spheres of reality are things like um, uh, implication relations. A and B implies A. So entails is a logical relation, part whole is an ontological relation. And then the first mistake of phantology is to say that all form is logical form. And you can find that sentence verbatim in Wittgenstein, for instance. And I have this paper called Against Phantology, where I, I give all the evidence of this crime. So, I have a lot of slides now, well, I still have time, uh, about phantology. Um, now, the, the, I said that it depends what you mean by a predicate and depends what you mean by a thing in, if you're going to understand what phantology amounts to, or the spreadsheet ontology amounts to. So there is one view which tries to do ontological justice to phantology. So this is a, 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 an understanding of the semantics of predicate logic in terms of ontological notions which are sort of compatible with Aristotle or with the, the philosopher whose name begins with P. Um, so, in this view, F, the, the big letter, the F stands for a property, and the little letters stand for an individual. You don't really know what an individual is from this, but not, Nelson Goodman uses the term a lot. Um, so, he has a calculus of individuals. And then, I do use the, nearly use the name of the philosopher who begins with P here. So you have this realm of properties, and you could also make F stand for the set of all the individuals who have that property. So these are two alternative ways of reading this. Nelson Goodman would reject both because he was a nominalist, so he didn't believe in sets, and he didn't believe in properties. But some people have accepted this kind of view of phantology. So the spreadsheet has the properties listed along the top, and all the individuals in the universe, every single damned atom, assuming that perfect science still believes in atoms, listed down the vertical side of the spreadsheet. So, according to this broadly ontological reading of phantology, the world is made of properties and individuals, and the individuals have these properties, in much like the way that the substance has the accidents in the Aristotelian view. And when we know science, then what we know is that the sum of all the properties associated with each individual. I think that's a very weird view of what science yields. Uh, but that's the, uh, the outcome of the Armstrongian phantologist approach. I like Armstrong very much, incidentally. I think he was a truly good philosopher. Um, he was the greatest living metaphysician until he died. Uh. Jonathan uh, Lowe recently died also. All right. So, the problem with the properties view, I mean, we understand what properties are in terms of qualities, temperature, color, and so on. That's, you can get your hands around that. It's not clear that the perfect science of the future will recognize those things, but at least we can understand what property might mean. But if the spreadsheet ontology approach is going to work, we're going to have to have relations, too. And these relations may be um, two place, but they may be 27 place. So we can assume that the future science will have to be able to deal with protein molecules or something like protein molecules, which might have, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of molecular components. And the, the fact that these molecular components are collected together in the protein, uh, the, the, fact, uh, the protein has to be a property, I guess. So if you have a, 
protein X, Y, Q, Z, W, protein X, Y, Q, Z, W, Z, and then you have a long list of 117 molecules. Now, that, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't seem to be something that you can really understand intelligibly in the way that we can understand one place properties or even two place relations like love. If we're dealing with 117 or 4 million 600 and, and so on places relate, place relations, then we are not dealing with anything which we can really take seriously. Now, another feature of phantology, which again has been confessed to uh, in the literature of the phantologists themselves, is if you take a view that reality has this shape, where A stands for the things, the individuals, the particulars, and F stands for the anything which is general, general, the attributes, and so on, then this amounts to the view that all generality belongs to the predicate. So the A is a mere name, it's a mere index. So it's like a social security number, it doesn't contain any information. Now, actually, scientists use names in such a way that the names are full of generality. So, the, the, this is a name, it's all of this. It's the DNA binding requirement of the yeast protein RAP1P is selected in silico from ribosomal protein gene promoter sequences. That's just one name. Now, that is not, to use that in science, is not going to be possible if you have to put all of that into, all of the generality here into the predicate, and then just say, holds of some uh, index. And so, this is ontologically complex, but the phantology puts all the ontological complexity into the F, and so they have to conclude that the A is referring to something simple. So if you can't have any ontological complexity in the A, that means the A must be referred to something simple, which is why both Wittgenstein and Russell became logical atomists. Why the substance of the universe is, is simple, according to Wittgenstein. So you've, you're forced to atomism. The spreadsheet ontology only works if there are atoms, if everything is an atom. And so that's why the phantologists ended up being atomists. And so they can't do justice to coarse-grained versus fine-grained partitions of reality. They can't do justice to the canary ostrich DNA molecule zooming phenomenon that we referred to earlier because the reality for them only has one level, the level of simples. And Wittgenstein says we can't know what the simples are, but we know that there must be simples. The reason why, we must, why there must be simples is because predicate logic forces the names of the things which exist in reality themselves to be simple, to simple names. You can't have complex names. And because you can't have complex names, and because logic is a, a mirror of reality, the things which are named by the names have to be simple themselves. And that's why... So, phantology I see as being the evil force behind 20th century good philosophy. It would have been great without phantology. And phantology forces them to be reductionists. Which is why Searle doesn't believe that money exists. Because Searle too was subject to this evil force. And phantology tends to make you believe in some future state of total science. That's Goodman, uh, 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 Armstrong again. Um... It forces you to isolate atoms. That's why Carnap's construction stru structure of the of the logical structure of what's it called? The universe? Logische Aufbau der Welt, the logical structure of the world, I guess. Um, why they he had to have atoms and he chose at atomic sensations which could stand in relations of matching as his atoms. He was forced to find atoms. Uh, at the phantology forces you to believe in bare particulars. 
particulars which are just bare. That you, you can add the Fs, but there is something which is the A which is bare. It's only when you add the Fs that you get something more than a bare particular or something. Uh, and that's why Wittgenstein couldn't tell us what symbols were like because they're bare. They're completely the unknown. They're un the, the core particulars are unknown and unknowable, and this is another element of Kantianism. But if that's the case, if the, if the ultimate substance of reality is simple, then what could it be in virtue of which A is such that F holds of it rather than not F? So this is a real thorny problem, which is why they wasted so many papers uh, worrying about things like uh, absence of color and so forth, or the truth makers for negative propositions. Um, another conscious consequence, which I won't go into, is that properties have to be timeless. Um, all form is not logical form. All necessity is logical necessity. All states of affairs have to be independent from each other. And therefore, probability has to be combinatoric. That's Armstrong again. To understand properties is to understand predication, and to understand predication is to follow uh, Frege's view of predication as functional application. So for Aristotle, we have predication in the category of substance, predication in the category of accident. They only have this. They don't have predication in the category of substance. And, and so it goes on. Uh, So they, if F of A also has to be the form of laws of nature, uh, how are we going to deal with differential equations in the future perfect science if all we have is F of A? Well, the answer is we can't have differential equations. Um, this is why this strand of philosophy of science died. Because even the future perfect science was not good enough. Um, all right, so there's a lot more like this. You can't deal with time. So, if A is simple, how could it gain and lose properties, which you need if you're going to have time and change? Uh, phantology had its roots in mathematics because the F stands for function, and this is, this is a functional application view. And mathematics has no need for time. So you take an ontology which might work pretty well for mathematics, and you apply it to the whole of reality, and the consequence is that because you have no room for time, Reality has to be unchanging. So the spreadsheet is, in fact, not just a spreadsheet of how the universe is now. It's a spreadsheet of how the universe is. Which means you have to be a determinist. Because it has to be determined at every mm -hmm. given time, if there were time, what will happen in all future times and what will have happened in all past times. And this leads to four-dimensionalism. So the, the block universe of four-dimensionalism is a consequence of phantology. Um, so another view, another consequence of phantology is a weird view of universal. So if you're an Aristotelian, you think there is a universal redness and a universal squareness and a universal Volkswagen Pinto-ness. Well, that's Aristotle 2066. But you don't believe that there's a universal not redness, or a universal redness or squareness, or a universal if red then square. But if you're a phantologist, then if F stands for a property and G stands for a property, it follows that F and G, F or G, not F, F therefore G, all stand for properties too. As you can see by the way they run their algorithms. So you get uh, a lattice, even non-self-identity is going to be a property. So, and then it gives you a poor treatment of relations. So, if this is your view, if this is your mirror of nature, you remember we had the problem earlier on about continua. You're going to find it very hard to deal with the continuum of the color space by means of this kind of approach. You need some addicity, even if it's very long addicity. And continuum is too long. And even if we think about something 
like a headache. You might say headache F and then head A, although the head is already too carries too much generality to figure, so we just call it 137. That's the name of the thing which has the headache. So headache holds up 137. But that won't do, because it's not just one thing which has a headache. It's an incredibly complicated collection of neuronal entities in somebody's brain, which is the bearer of a headache. And these are connected to each other via continuous connections, and they're changing continuously in various dimensions, and it's because of those continuous changes that the headache exists. And so that means that we're dealing with something which is not just of continuum size addicity, but of multiple dimensions of variation, which are multiple dimensions of continuous variation size addicity. And that goes way, way beyond you can ever get the first order predicate logic. So you can't do headaches. You can't do holes with an H. And now, so you can't really do anything. And that's what, so you don't understand resemblance. You don't understand similarity. And so you talk about family resemblances. So that is the last desperate measure to try and shore up at least one hole in phantology. And David Lewis, then he, he tried to shore up the hole by adding a lot of possible wealth. Um, so what the family resemblance, uh, well, no, we don't need to talk about that. All right, so what is the better view? And I'll do this very quickly. So I think that first order logic was a great achievement. So I think Frege and Armstrong and all of the people between them were, were great philosophers. They made one mistake. They thought that the language of first order logic was a mirror of reality. And what we need, and the best mirror of reality is Aristotle 2016. We just renamed it three weeks, four weeks ago. Um, Aristotle 2016 tells you that there are, on the one hand, things or entities in the widest possible sense, including people, artifacts, holes, environments, and so forth. And then there are qualities, and there are processes. In fact, there are just what. BFO says there are spatial regions, so there are kissings and thumpings and conversations, there are buildings, there are processes of getting warmer and getting hungrier. All, of, all Many of these things involve continuum phenomena, which phantology can't do very well. And so what you get is the Aristotelian ontological sextet. You have universals and particulars in the category of substance, in the category of quality, and in the category of process. And uh, tropes uh, get mentioned here, finally. Um, so D Jonathan Lowe had a four-category ontology. This is, of course, the correct six-category ontology. And there are some people who think that we need an eight-category ontology with qualities of processes. But I'm resisting so again we can go through there is trope nominalism which runs together qualities and processes and makes, makes them all be particulars there is phantology which has just properties which are somehow spanning the border between qualities and processes and particulars which are bare they don't have they, they're bare you can't say anything more about them other than they're bare and then we have the, the set theoretic view, which is Quine's view. There are sets. I'm not sure why I put sets on the processes. And there are elements of sets. Um, and of course, there are sets of sets, of sets of sets of sets. So you get some kind of complexity there. In fact, this view is better than the phantological view because you have the set theoretic hierarchy um, for what it's worth. So, according to this view, there are one-place qualities and one-place uh, processes, and there are relational qualities and relational processes. So, this is a relational quality, and, and the thumping would be a relational process, where one thing thumps another. Now, we can do... Uh, um, well, this is 
this is a, a more detailed presentation. So quality particulars instantiate quality universals, process particulars instantiate process universals, substance particulars instantiate substance universals, substance particulars exemplify quality universals, and process particulars have participants which have substance particulars. Um, now, so we have variables which range over all of these things, both over universals and over particulars, in the A place. So we have F holds of A, and A can range not just over individuals, but also over universals. So this quality particular instantiates this quality universal would be instantiates bracket quality particular number 333 comma quality universal number 7 close bracket and so we have a relatively small number of formal relations which are the pr only predicates in this language instantiate instantiates is part of exemplifies and so on we, we, we maybe about 20 and this, this gives you the syntax. So x and y range over both universals and particulars. Particular x instantiates universal y looks like this. So we, we explode the A. We make the A range over generals as well as over particulars. And we, we reduce the predicates to formal ties. And in this way, we do justice to um, um, uh, one idea in the Tractatus, which is that logic does not represent anything. But we, we explode that idea by saying the predicates don't represent anything either. They're not extra entities. There are no Fs and Gs. There is just identity or part of, which are not extra entities which get stuck on things. They, they are part of the structure, part of the formal structure of what exists. And this is called Vollhut, first order logic with universal terms, which rhymes with the German word for rabies. <laughs> um, and that's more or less it. So I will put the slides... So it's actually, the syntax is quite close to the syntax of set theory. So we have, just in set theory, we have just a few predicates, which are all formal, and they're all binary, or Standard bit, that all, all right, so I will put the slides online and I will email everybody the slides. Uh, I, I, did you put your email address on this? No. no. So if there is anyone who is not registered for the class, they should put their email on this. And then I will add you to the email list for the class. And then if you have any questions, send them not to the list but send them to me in the first place, and then any answers I will send to the whole list. And yes? Are we going to sign up for the student presentations at some point? Yes. And what are those going to be on? You can choose, uh, but you should talk to me beforehand. And um, do you, were you not here at the very beginning? I was, but forgot to ask that during the meeting. Okay, so the, the, you, you need to uh, produce a draft of your, present, a draft of your paper are roughly halfway through the uh, semester. Um, so well before then, you should know what you're going to write about. And so you can email me a suggestion, or you can meet me either before class or after the class. And uh, that I don't make any constraints on what you write about, so long as it exists. So no unicorns. All right, any more? Questions or requests? Yep. Uh, I, I understand this will require a very abbreviated answer, but uh, what's at stake between competing metaphysical theories? Uh, for example, so I, so I wonder, we might say a human is a process. Yep. We might say a human is an entity. Seems like either one seems like a sensible way of talking. Uh, why would we favor one? I mean, what's it say when we say, is a human really, really a, an entity, or are they really, really a process? So, the philosophical answer to that question is uh, predicated on 
uh, another question, Amy. Are you a student of philosophy? Yes. Why? If you don't think that those kinds of questions are worth pursuing, then why are you a student of philosophy? I don't have a background in metaphysics. So. Oh, I see. So you are a student of which branch of philosophy per preference? Ethics? Uh, yes, ethics, yes. Ethics. I, I, do, I, do, I do meta-ethics now, which I understand the field of metaphysical stuff, but I'm not. I'm a okay, so uh, I think I need to talk to you separately. Uh, then, um, I think that actually good ethics is going to have to rest on a good metaphysics. But to convince you of that would not be easy. Now, I do have another answer, which is that I think that you can prove that some metaphysical theories or some metaphysical approaches are more useful than others. But that's because I work in applied ontology where I have a happy hunting ground for empirical uh, proofs which is not usual among philosophers. So I think it really does make a difference. I think there is something that turns on these kinds of questions, uh, which is why I take them so seriously, I, apart from the fact that I just hate the French. <laughs> philosophers. Bad ones. Which they mostly are. <laughs> yeah? So you seem to try to give an argument that phantology ends up in atomism, but isn't it more accurate just to say that phantologists tend to be atomists? If, if we take phantology synonymous with spreadsheet ontology, why can't just the particulars be all the atoms, all the, you know, uh, combinations of possible atoms? I don't understand that. why is, why you think there's this so strong connection. So, the argument has to do with all generality goes in the predicate. That means that the, what the term, the, in, the constant term points to cannot have any generality built into it. Now, it may be that there are indeed complex atoms, but they would be random. There would be complex, sorry, not complex atoms, complex entities as well as simples. Um, Wittgenstein gets tied in knots when he tries to cope with those. Um, they can't be things like... Um, uh, so they can't involve relations which have any generality. So they have to be complex complexes of atoms which are just stuck together in ways which we can't say, because if they're stuck together by a part-whole relations, then that's generality on the side of the atom or the object which that you can't have. So it's, it's along those lines that you get the argument. And I, you can see the argument being worked out with, with some pain in the literature on the tractate. Some of it in Wittgenstein himself, some of it in the secondary literature. How do you get Wittgenstein's account of sentences, propositions, to enable you to say things about the parts of a watch? So you'll find literature on that. And they, 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 they are caught with this, within this phantological prison without realizing it. Um, so they didn't realize what a problem they created for themselves by seeing f of a as being a mirror of nature within which the all the generality is on the side of the person. That was the crucial failing. And even Frege did not make that. Well, Frege had these problems with sets, but anyone who allows sets to be on the side of the A is already in much better shape. So if you allow sets of sets, you're already free to have the kinds of complexity that you want. But if you only have F and A, you can't have set. You can't have F of F. You have to have just two levels, and then you'll stop. Yeah? Um, so that's why it's called Folvud. It's first order logic, which is it. So I, I had a couple questions. Um, yeah. First, an easy one. Can you give a, an example of exemplification? So you exemplify the quality of being five foot nine ish. Okay. All right, fine. Um, secondly, can you kind of explain your resistance to uh, processes bearing qualities in that debate? So I want the entities in my ontology to be only those entities which are really there. 
So if I give you a bowl of three oranges, and I say, what's in the bowl? And you say, well, four things. There are the three oranges, and then there is the threeness. I will say, you're double counting. There isn't the three oranges plus the threeness. If you have three oranges, you already have the threeness. Now, similarly, but if I say, um, what is... No, I, 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 so, but, and, and similarly, if I say, if I have somebody running at four feet per second, how many process do I, how many process entities do I have? And you say, well, you have the one process, which is the running, and the other process, which is the four feet per second quality. Then I will say, but this running is, has to be a four feet per second running, because if it wasn't, it would be a different process. Did I say that right? This process has to be a four feet per second process. Because if it was a three feet per second process, it would be a different process. So in other words, the process already contains within itself the quality. And that's not true with your five foot nineness. You could chop your head off and you could five foot four and a half. <laughs> yeah? So along similar lines... And it would still be you, but the head part. So, so along similar lines, uh, I know there's some people who try and they want to adhere to nominalism because they're afraid of a boogeyman or Platonism or something. Yeah. Um, Quite right, too. So, but could you could you talk maybe a little bit about uh, the delineations between your categorical universal real, you know, universal realism and how it kind of differs from Platonism? So, the Aristotle had a view of universals as being in the things which uh, instantiate those universals. And that's the view that I'm trying to maintain. Now, the view will not quite work. Um, so let's... We have the universal fist. And it's instantiated whenever anyone does that. Now, I'm sure there are many people doing that now. But it could be that there's a whole minute during which no one in the universe makes a fist. I want to say that the universal fist even exists in that minute. So that's the one place where I think Aristotle will have a problem but broadly speaking, we see the universals all around us. The shapes, the colors, the magnetisms, the electric, I don't know. We, 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 we can measure them, we can assay them. So, uh, we, and the similarities are, uh, the, the knowledge of the similarities underlies the measurement techniques that we use. So, not just in science, but in virtually everything that we do, whether it's reading or hearing somebody speak or planning or uh, taking a, a bus somewhere, we are seeing universal in the things. That's why we climb into the bus rather than climbing into the frog. Because we see the universal bus. Just, um, it seems to me that uh, phantology is closer to the Aristotelian perspective than the Kantian perspective. Because, uh, because even if it has a different method this logical and this method, um, it really talks about the world, not about what we perceive. And so, I mean, Russell changed his mind many times, but he was realist towards universal. So, so he believes that he believed that there was something as a universal in the world, really. And so, and this is different from so the Kantian. I, it's a strand within phantology. I would agree with you that the, the major people in phantology, like Russell and Armstrong. Uh, are not Kantian. But there is something like linguistic Kantianism which says, so the general view, general version is, the reality that you live in is a reflection of the language you use. So, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, there are various anthropologists who defend views like that, according to which the Hopi Indians, for instance, don't have n numbers greater than five because they don't have words for numbers greater than five, and which is not. Um, and which is empirically no longer taken seriously because the Hopi Indian language actually does allow you to say things with, what was the name of the? Sapphire. Um, now the specific version of linguistic Kantianism that is afoot here is if we want to understand science, if, if we want to understand the world, we have to understand science, quine. If we want to understand science, we have to translate it into predicate logic, quine. 
And therefore, the only way we can understand the world is through the spectacle of the predicate logic, Quine. Now, Quine didn't actually make the next step in the argument, which is, therefore, we are linguistic Kantians, and we're going to make the world satisfy predicate logic shapes by torturing it, that's the technical term for the Kant. Um, it really is. Uh, <laughs> he didn't make that final line in the argument. I make that for him as an act of generosity. <laughs> so he never actually attacked differential equations, but he did attack other forms of speech that he didn't like because they wouldn't fit into predicate logic. Like modal logic. Yep. Uh, is uh, the UV student body an instance of the universal? Yep. Um, uh, in first book. In first book. Okay. It's an artifactual uh, universal. Um, and you want to say that this, if, if, even if there were never a UV, that would be. Uh, that would exist? No, on the contrary. Okay. The, the artifactual ones are even more closely tied to the Correct. real world of what happens in every case. So the, I, I like the Aristotelian idea that universals are parts, in some special sense of parts, mm -hmm. of their instances. That doesn't work so well for relational universals, and it doesn't work for fits. Sure. Uh, at least it might not work so well for fits. And things like this. Crowd is another example. Uh, that may be that, that the world is such that for a certain minute there are no crowds then. Yeah. By accident. I think given that there are different parts of the world with large bodies of people who are awake for 20, uh, all, at all times, we probably always have crowds. That's probably an easy one. Yep. I think the the metaphor of Alberti's grid can maybe lead people to think that only substances exist at a level of granularity and not outside of that. And that Remember, the grid is transparent. So it, the things which the grid allows you to see are there even before you erect the grid. And that's true of molecules and it's true of buildings. So I don't see that as a worry. All right, so we will meet again next week.